Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Eugene Harrington, co-project director of the HBCU CFE, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce another one of our webinars to you this afternoon. It's entitled, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Questioning Youth Behavioral Health Webinar. Just a little bit about the CFE. Uh, we uh, have a grant through um, an agreement with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is called SAMHSA, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, CSAT, and the Center for Mental Health Services, CMHS. Moha School of Medicine uh, established the Historically Black Colleges and University Center for Excellence in Behavioral Health, HBCU CFE, founded through a grant to number T1023447. Uh, a little bit about the goals of the HBCU CFE. We promote student behavioral health to positively impact student retention, expand campus service capacity, including the provision of culturally appropriate behavioral health resources. And lastly, we facilitate best practices, dissemination, and behavioral health workforce development. And with this said, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. David Levine. He's an MD, professor of pediatrics, Moha School of Medicine, a member of the uh, Committee on Adolescents, American Academy of Pediatrics, and uh, chair, Adolescent Health, Georgia Chapter, American Academy of Pediatrics. And I I introduce you to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Dr. Harrington, and thanks for the opportunity to um, hopefully share some lessons and information about this very important, underserved, and vulnerable population of young people. This is a presentation that is actually part of a national curriculum that we were fortunate to actually start here in Georgia called the Adolescent Reproductive and Sexual Health Education Program. It is a full curriculum related to adolescent reproductive and sexual health, and it's sponsored actually by Physicians for Reproductive Health. They used to be called Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health, and so you'll still see the PERCH acronym on the bottom, but you can actually get uh, the original of these presentations on the website at www.prh.org and look for RSHEP downloads. This is an adaptation, however, of their uh, online presentation to adapt to have a more behavioral health aspect uh, rather than a physical health aspect. So again, as you heard, these are uh, my credentials and um, part of the reason that I have developed expertise on this is because one of my tasks as member of the Committee on Adolescence was to update our clinical practice uh, guideline on working with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. And that publication should come out shortly this spring in Pediatrics, which is the journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So what do I expect um, that you guys will take out of this? that you'll be able to identify three risk factors um, to understand how homophobia and its sister element heterosexism contribute to health outcomes and to talk specifically about how to improve service delivery to sexual minority youth. And at the very end there's a lot of resources. I'm going to briefly talk about some of that but there's a lot of excellent validated websites that can provide a lot um, of additional information. So one of the things to um, start thinking about when we talk about working with this population is the first thing is to realize we cannot consider this a group of individuals that is abnormal. When we talk about healthy sexuality, healthy sexuality is meant to encompass all interhuman sexuality. So that would include heterosexual, bisexual, and uh, gay or lesbian relationships. So same-sex sexual behavior is included in the realm of healthy sexuality. So when uh, you talk about a physician thinking about healthy sexuality, we think about people being in a monogamous relationship. Um, certainly if there's any possibility for conception um, for the female partner to be on some kind of hormonal contraception um, along with using optimal barrier protection. And that's really what we consider healthy sexuality and what we really try to shape our young people into 
subscribing to the same idea of what is healthy sexuality. One of the uh, temptations and problem with this literature is that you will see that there are health disparities for sexual minority youth related to sexuality, mental health, substance abuse, and so young people that are involved in these risk behaviors are overrepresented, but you can't lose the fact that many, if not most, sexual minority teens actually get through adolescence relatively unscathed. I mean, we all suffer through our own adolescence and end up as quite resilient adults. And because of some of the obstacles that these young people have to face, many develop and possess incredible strength and self-determination and really can become leaders because of overcoming some of the challenges that they have faced. But we certainly know that when we talk about health disparities related to this population, what we're really talking about are the effects of discrimination in terms of homophobia, the irrational fear um, and discrimination against somebody who is perceived as being gay, bisexual, lesbian, transgender. And you see what these things can lead to uh, with decreased self-esteem, increased self-medication and substance abuse, increased risk-taking behavior, and unfortunately increases in suicidal ideation and actual suicide attempts. The sister concept of heterosexism is a bit more insidious than the in-your-face homophobia. And heterosexism really is the idea in people's minds that being heterosexual is the standard and everything else is somewhat abnormal. And you know, many uh, sexual minority youth are able to use heterosexism to hide. So they'll use gender neutral terms when they talk about relationships um, or just change the gender of who they're in relationships. But over time, hiding who people are really can have a lot of repercussions in terms of people developing their own positive self-esteem. And we know, really related to almost all risk behaviors, that if young people have positive self-esteem and have a very good self-image, they do well and they participate in a lot less risk behaviors. But when we look, just as an example, at youth sexual behaviors when we look at the difference between, um, in this case, gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth versus heterosexual youth, you see there are significant disparities in terms of how many have had sex, how many have had sex at a very early age, how many have had sex with three or more partners, and um, even more important, substance abuse at the last time of uh, sexual intercourse. And the other issue that happens is because of homophobia, what happens to the young people is when they're interested in getting some help, there may be a barrier to allow them to get help because of a perceived lack of confidentiality, especially on a college campus um, or a high school. As you can imagine, if word of somebody being gay or lesbian um, got out in their peer group, it could have repercussions for themselves. So in a lot of ways, young people may just be hiding and not going in to get services because of the fear of being disclosed to other people. Of course, they also have a fear of what kind of reaction that the health or behavioral health specialist will actually provide to them if they disclose. You know, I've had patients that have not realized when they first met me that I was actually open to talking about any aspect about sexuality. And I remember specifically one young man that when we were talking and I asked the very important question about the gender of his partners and, um, and the origin for this young man to have actually had a suicide attempt and he came to me afterwards, he kind of very gently um, said to me in, in a very interesting tone that he had been forced out of his home and then he used the term because I told my father that I was homosexual. And that was actually the term that he used 
with the inflection that he used. And he was surprised when I was open and accepting um, of that. But you can tell that he had been um, hurt, really, in other disclosures in the healthcare environment. And of course, there is this assumption, again, of heterosexuality. Um, many young people may be empowered enough. Um, I, I've had patients that have um, uh, told me previously that they have actually corrected physicians um, about their relationships. So young ladies that have said, do you have a boyfriend? Um, sometimes feel very empowered, but many times it can serve as an obstacle towards young people getting quality health care. So one of the things that is really important is in regardless of what setting that we use, we have to create a safe space um, for young people um, to actually be able to communicate with the physician and feel comfortable as a location for service or for care. And even if the professionals that are in the clinic, you know, the therapists, the counselors, the physicians, uh, maybe nurse practitioners, physician assistants, even if these are folks that may have done extra training, extra understanding about working with sexual minority youth, they're not the first contact that they see when they come into a center. It's going to be a receptionist or perhaps even a security person pointing people in the right direction. Everybody needs to be trained and everybody needs to be on the same page <clears throat> related to taking care of young people and welcoming people into the center. So certainly training all staff is important. Assuring confidentiality really from almost the very start of any encounter. We should not assume that young people will believe that everything's going to be confidential unless we actually tell them it's going to be confidential. Certainly displaying affirming materials, having posters, having uh, newsletters, information in your center is also another way for young people to feel welcome when they come when they're sitting in the waiting room. Providing support resources. We certainly know that we can't do everything ourselves. So allowing young people to explore validated good information um, that we can provide for them and perhaps even uh, referring young people to support groups or to other services that are available in their communities. And you will see some of the places where you can try to find those resources at the very end of this presentation. And again, in a center like this, we really need to have zero tolerance for insensitivity. Certainly, if there is an initial insensitive remark or perception, uh, sending somebody for some training is fine. But if that were to happen again, really, we need to have zero tolerance in all of our centers related to working with sexual minority youth. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to illustrate a lot of the concepts about working with youth through some case histories. And of course, these are made up patients. These are not patient privacy violations. Um, and we know the first one's a little bit young for your age, but it absolutely is a great case to really orient people to issues related to gender. So the first case is of a young man named Joseph who is 13. He comes to the clinic with his mother. She's concerned that most of his friends are girls. He's drawn to traditionally feminine activities and she even caught him wearing his sister's clothing. So I would like you just for a moment just to think how does Joseph's mother's disclosure make you personally feel? The reason is we are all products of this society. Um, certainly we have geographic differences. I'm from Atlanta now. Atlanta is a more progressive community, but we are part of the conservative South. So one of the journeys that we may have to make is to actually understand where we're coming from if we feel feelings of heterosexism or homophobia. How do we process that information? How do we get beyond that information? How do we get beyond racism, for example, is not a very different concept. We all are raised with stereotypical images of different groups, and we have to understand our personal biases to get beyond there. If at any time 
your personal bias is so strong that you feel it's going to interfere with the ability to provide good quality care for young people, then it really is our responsibility to refer to a quality professional for these young people. But hopefully people will be able to follow this pathway of understanding, confronting, and working on personal biases in order to be able to provide the best care for everybody that is in your community. Um, one of the things to realize is if we generate these biases and the young people pick up on it, it really can be even more damaging to their self-esteem than if they came in off the street without this information. You know, they're coming into an environment where they want to trust a professional. And if the professional is not trusting, then it really will interfere with their ability to develop good relationships with other people. As you see, it is an ethical obligation to refer. So what do the mother's concerns reveal about Joseph's sexuality? Very little. And the reason is Joseph may be questioning his sexuality and or gender identity, but dress and other outward appearance do not indicate sexual orientation or identity. So when you look at this paradigm of sexuality, and you'll see in the different sections we're going to emphasize different of these bubbles, we're really talking about all of these aspects when we talk about sexuality. Intercourse or sexual behavior is part of the picture, but it is not all about sexuality. So in this situation, we're really talking about gender identity and gender expression. The personal conception of oneself as male or female really is gender identity. There's been some really interesting research that's been done on this, and as a general pediatrician, I still do work with young children as well, and I can tell you, at age three, we actually ask the parents, can your child identify him or herself as a girl or a boy? Really, by age four, research has shown that gender identity is stable and that gender is constant. So when we look at gender identity and expression, we have to realize that sometimes biological sex does not always match how people feel about their gender internally. Does not, however, mean that people need to do anything about it necessarily, as we're going to talk about as we talk about options for treatment, etc. So when you talk about gender and sex, and you're going to see a lot of these arrows and uh, these continuum in the presentation. And you're going to see that they're going to get increasingly complex. And that should not be a surprise because humans are incredibly complex. So natal sex and anatomy, well, natal sex is really considered the birth biological sex. That's one that is more carved in stone by anatomy. However, the perception of somebody's gender identity can be on the spectrum from very female to very male, and their gender expression is anywhere from feminine to masculine. And again, this does not correlate with sexual behavior, as we will see a little bit later. And of course, this is also a spectrum for young people, and all of these things are involved in gender and sex. So when we talk about transgender, it really is an umbrella term. And the, the best kind of general definition is somebody whose gender identity does not conform to conventional gender roles. And these are often terms that are used um, within the transgender and gay and lesbian community, as well as somewhat in the medical community. Um, when we talk about intersex, those are um, people that actually do have hormonal imbalances at birth that can actually affect their anatomy. But the rest are really more community representations. One interesting term on there is two-spirit. Um, in my research on transgender, I found it fascinating 
that there is one culture that truly celebrates people that are transgender, and that's actually Native American cultures. Now, of course, not every culture may uh, represent the predominant culture of some of the major tribes, but in the major tribes, people that are born uh, one gender but exhibit traits from another gender are actually revered as having both a male and a female spirit in their body. And that is something that is highly valued in many Native American cultures to have a spirit in your body. And so these are young people that are considered to have two spirits and are actually revered rather than despised, which is unfortunately what happens more in our mainstream society. So when we talk about transgender, these are ways that we actually refer, so we're talking in a common language. So we'll use MTF as male to female or even male transitioning to female. Really, it's what we consider transgender women, and female to male are transgender men, and the process and the time is of uh, going from one gender to the other is considered transition. So how do we approach gender identity with adolescent patients or clients? This is actually quite a good question to ask people when you think of yourself as a person. Do you think of yourself as male, female, both, or another gender? And allow the young person the time to reflect and report back. Now, do you need to ask this question of every person that's uh, in front of you? Maybe not, but this is a situation where we will have our own clinical judgment in terms of is the person in front of you following uh, standard gender roles of our society. So if it is somebody who is male, who looks very masculine and has adopted just very masculine traits and lifestyle, then no, this is not a question that you would necessarily need to ask. If you have any questions about gender nonconformity, then this is an excellent question to ask. So when we talk about transition, certainly we know you are mostly behavioral health experts, but it's always good to know what young people that are interested in transition actually have in terms of care. Now there is some controversy <clears throat> because of starting at age nine, but if you remember, the idea is that gender identity is fixed by age four. So if you have a family that is engaged in this process, if the parents are on board with the young person, then fully reversible transition can actually start as early as age nine with use of puberty blocking hormones. We have experience using these medications for young people um, that are actually going through puberty at a very uh, early age. So somebody who has what is called precocious puberty, for example, uh, a little girl that might start through puberty at age five, we actually use chemicals that block the further development of puberty in order to allow the person to go through puberty at a regular time. So we have a lot of experience with using these medications. And the nice thing about these medications is as soon as you stop, then puberty would actually restart. So this is fully reversible. Then at about age 16 is when most experts talk about starting transgender male or female hormones. That is partially reversible. Some of the effects um, do continue even if you stop using the medications. But in order to continue to develop and maintain the appearance of the desired gender, then uh, it really is necessary to continue using these uh, hormonal treatments. And then the irreversible stage, of course, is surgery. And again, virtually every center says after achieving adulthood. Now, one of the issues, as you heard at the beginning, um, we should not pathologize every sexual minority young person that comes into our centers. Because again, these are young people that can be incredibly resilient. 
But this is an issue when we're talking about gender nonconformity, gender dysphoria, um, gender identity. It is important um, for young people to actually have mental health counseling because of exploring the role of living as the opposite gender and making sure that the individual is actually ready for irreversible uh, gender reassignment or transition. And what you find out is through therapy, um, there are some people that actually do resolve their gender dysphoria in adolescence um, or as adults. And these may be just uh, people that you know that are kind of gender benders. You know, they prefer to dress or act like themselves, which may in fact be closer to the opposite gender, but they don't necessarily um, desire any kind of transition care. They're fine with their bodies the way that they are. And of course, some do desire medical transition care. So back to Joseph. Joseph tells you he's not sure if he thinks of himself as a girl or a boy. He's actually okay with this, but it makes him upset and sad that his mother is not happy. So what can we do? Well, again, in my population, we're also working with parents. Now, in your population, you may have young people that um, are accompanied by parents, or you may have access to parents. So one of the things is to make sure that it's okay to speak with a parent. Um, remember, this is part of a confidential history that we're doing with young people, and some young people may not want you to talk to their parents at this point. Then we would validate his mother's concerns if we have permission to talk with her, reassure her, and then also talk to her that if this does turn out that he is transgender, that it is actually okay, and there are treatments that are available to allow the young person to unlock their potential. And of course, for parents identifying resources, again, that you'll see near the end of this presentation, so that the parents can actually do some of their own self-exploration about their roles. All right, so I'm going to go on to the next case. This is a case of Sophia. She's an 18-year-old who comes to your clinic for a sports physical. On her intake form, she indicates she's sexually active, but has not been on contraception. So that is, of course, something that we would be concerned about. And as you'll see, we should really be concerned about regardless of how Sophia feels about her sexual orientation. So the question is, how do you discuss sensitive issues with young clients? This is an acronym that was developed by uh, physicians and has been refined over the years. It initially was just one E, one D, and one S. But you see, these are young these are issues for us to explore with young people um, that give us a good idea of what's happening in the young person's kind of community and milieu. And when you look at this, it actually goes from uh, less intrusive to more intrusive. And then we put strengths at the end specifically because we really are trying to get to a strength and asset approach for young people. It's very interesting. You can have people that are involved in substance abuse and sexuality. You give them something positive to do that's within their interests. They do that positivity. You follow up with them. You reinforce that positivity, and risk behaviors actually drop away. So that really is one of the reasons why that third S on there is specifically for working with young people to draw out their strengths, to reinforce their strengths, and to help them to build positive self-esteem and self-efficacy. And of course, sexuality is a very important part of this. So as you begin the sexual interview, Sophia discloses that she self-identifies as a lesbian. So again, when we look back at this paradigm of sexuality, now what we're really talking about is sexual attraction and sexual orientation. So what is sexual orientation? I don't have to tell you this is a society that has a lot of different ideas of what is orientation. But sexual orientation is not a choice. 
It is somebody's innate uh, construct of their own personality. It really refers to an individual's pattern of physical and emotional arousal towards other people. And you see physical and emotional. If you remember, we have that spectrum from homosexual to heterosexual. Well, there may be some people that are 95% heterosexual, but maybe once a month may have an erotic dream about somebody of the same sex. Is that normal? Absolutely. When we talk about these terms, you'll see uh, these definitions a lot. Of course, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual are very common and, and used commonly. Pansexual is a very interesting term. We seem to have a desire in our society to categorize people, to put people in boxes. And what pansexual folks say is, don't do that to me. Don't put me in a box. I'm a sexual being. Maybe I feel bisexual right now. Maybe I feel gay tomorrow. It doesn't matter. I'm a sexual being and just leave it at that. And like many other communities, there have been movements to actually take the words that were initially offensive and give them back to the community to de-energize the term so that the term queer is often used now between sexual minority youth as a way of de-energizing and empowering themselves more than anything else. So what determines sexual orientation is still a really good question. Certainly it is not a choice. It is a combination of genetics, hormonal influence, and environmental influence, and that's about the best that we can get at this point. But it really is considered generic, genetic variation rather than it to be considered a disorder. Interestingly, young people first become aware of, of same-sex attraction, usually at a very young age as well. And many studies actually uh, delineate that by age 16, many youth actually self-identify. So now when we start looking at this sexuality model, of course we had biological sex, we had gender identity and expression, and you see how uh, biological sex and gender identity is somewhat complex. You can have somebody who is born male, who has more feminine roles, um, or somebody who seems quite androgynous in the middle. Well, we have to add sexual orientation to this mix, which means people may be attracted to neither women, both men or other. And this is where it starts getting complicated. And should we be surprised that this is complicated? And the answer is no. We all know that humans are incredibly complicated and sexuality and the sexual determination in your, in your mind is incredibly complicated. And because of that, we need to be open to all sorts of variations along the sexuality model. So of course a lot of people want to know, um, we are still a statistically built society, um, how many young people are out there. This becomes a very difficult uh, question to answer because we really don't have any nationally representative surveys that really accurately capture what's going on in the entire United States. There are some states that do include questions on sexual orientation by adding extra question to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance. So it's also called YRBS. Um, well, we find out that it's only 12 states and another six local communities. And the 12 states tend to be very, very progressive states. So there is also inconsistency about that. So I'm going to show you some statistics, but again, this is kind of almost a best guess based on extrapolating what is information to a general population. And you see, again, the variation that can happen in terms of the
the state youth risk behavior surveys. So when we look, we see that more and more states are asking, but unfortunately, we see we're still not at a large number of states that are asking the, the correct questions for us to be able to really understand what is the scope of the population, what are the disparities that we're seeing. So we um, have to rely on either statewide data or kind of national sampling data. So Vermont um, did their analysis and uh, did find out um, in their last administration of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that they found a significant but small population, as you see here. This is a national study um, called the Growing Up Today study. It was actually done from 97 to 2003, um, looking at uh, students reporting sexual orientation by sex. The interesting thing in this study was they also found that the young people actually were um, quite happy with mostly heterosexual as um, a term, and that's something that's been replicated in other studies, is again, this is a generation that is much more flexible in terms of how they feel about their own sexuality. Um, so when you see you know, young people, now they're saying 12.6% of females in this study were mostly heterosexual. And it is getting towards the complexity of sexual orientation and sexual behavior. So when we look in um, Minnesota, they did a high school student sample, as you see. This was a little older in 1992. Um, and you see self-reporting increases in terms of increase in homosexual attraction. Um, and that you see that 1.1% uh, in their situation had reported as bisexual or predominantly homosexual, although they did have a very large percentage of young people that were unsure as well. So getting back to Sophia, she does self-disclose her sexual orientation, but if she hadn't, how would you bring up the topic? And the answer is you have to ask. Um, most Sexual minority youth are invisible and will not raise the issue because of those perceived barriers due to homophobia. So asking questions about the gender of their partners and their identity as well as orientation normalizes the fact that there is a range and of these uh, issues and that young people are, should feel comfortable in the center talking about how they feel, who they are, and talking about ways to really allow them to maximize their own health outcomes. So how do we ask? These are really good questions, you know. It's not, are you gay? It's, are you sexually attracted to guys, girls, or both? And there are some times where we actually may have young people that have never had sex, but still do identify as being a member of a sexual minority group. And again, this is another excellent question when you think of yourself in a relationship. Is it with a guy, a girl, or both? And asking the question specifically like that normalizes the idea that it really would be okay if you were in a same-sex relationship. Now, sometimes what you'll get when you ask this question is, well, I'm not gay. And so then sometimes it is important to explain that it's a bridging question, that it's very important um, because of disparities related with the population so that it is a question that we ask to all of the clients that we have that come into our center. So um, how do you respond to Sophia's disclosure? Well, um, this is um, a really important thing that we can do to help young people that are out to themselves but what's next. So there may be young people that are out and they're open and they understand their feelings, but they still may be suffering because of the heterosexism and homophobia of society. So one of the things that we have to figure out is how comfortable are they with the feelings and with having coming out to themselves. Um, and then really we can help young people to disclose the information when it's appropriate to family, friends,
school, etc. But we should never out a client or a patient, of course, to anybody without the patient or client's permission. Um, in terms of even talking about a referral or anything, everything needs to be with the permission of the adolescent or young adult. But one of the things that we certainly can do is to counsel and facilitate communication with parents. Sometimes it may very well even be, if you're in the local community and the parents in the local community, that you bring in the parents and you bring in the young person as well. And while the health provider is in the room, we actually can disclose that information with the parent and the parents are much less likely to overreact if there's actually a health practitioner in the room. So when we talk about Sophia, she discloses her parents are aware and are actually quite accepting, but she's not in a relationship right now with a, with a young lady. So what other questions should we ask? Well, sometimes sexual behavior is not predicted by sexual orientation or maybe even what people would normally say is sexual attraction. Sexual orientation does not equal behavior. That is something, if you had to take it out, one thing to take away from here, it's really important. And again, we try to put young people into the box. So if they're a gay student, then suddenly we think that um, it's a male is only going to have sex with men and females are only going to sec have sex with females. And that's actually not true at all when we look at our behavioral data. The majority of women who have sex with women have had sex with men, and many continue to have sex with men. So with this situation, we respect her identification. We still should inquire about her sexual behaviors with males, specifically because in this case it can affect her reproductive and sexual health. So Sophia then discloses she currently is having sex with a male friend because meeting guys is easier because there aren't many girls who are out in her school. So that's why it's still going to be important to talk about contraception and to talk about condom use. This is very interesting. So when you look at young women who identified as unsure um, they're almost as, twice as likely to report no contraceptive use. And when we look at pregnancy risk, um, lesbian and bisexual young people are about as likely to have had sex, but twice the number of pregnancies, and almost three times the number of two or more pregnancies. And even if you look at the opposite side, when you look at the, the role of men, I clearly remember a young man when I was the medical director of a school-based clinic in Oakland, California. He had been out on campus since ninth grade, and he was actually quite accepted on campus. He was part of the fabric. He um, himself did not experience homophobia on campus. But what he did feel is the perception that because he was gay, that he was less of a man. So of course, what do you think that he did? Of course he fathered um, a baby in order to prove that he was a man. And if we had really gotten in and talked with him ahead of time about the fact that he certainly still is a man, <clears throat> even if he's attracted to other men, that could have prevented this teen pregnancy. Fortunately, when I left Oakland, California, the baby was about two and a half and was doing just fine. So it is important to continue to discuss hormonal contraception, and it is important to discuss emergency contraception. And remember where our current laws are is that it is over-the-counter and does not need a prescription if you're over 17, although you still have to go to the pharmacy counter and ask for it. But it does require an advanced prescription if you are less than 17 years. So what we try to do in our care centers is actually provide them an advanced prescription that they can use for an entire year because in most communities and states when you write a prescription you can actually access it for up to a year. And these are the current brands that are out there of emergency contraception. 
This is another uh, misconception. Um, it used to really be thought of that women that were specifically only in asexual relationship with women would not have sexually transmitted infections. And we actually find that there are increased risks for trichomonas, for HPV, which is human papillomavirus that you'll hear about a little bit is a cause for genital warts and genital cancers, also bacterial vaginosis and HIV. So uh, lesbians certainly do have increased risks. So it is important that when we talk with uh, women that are having sex with women, to talk and to take it to the next level. Many uh, women that are in, in relationships with other women use sex toys, so it's really important to not share without a condom, to wash the sex toys. Um, we continue to struggle with trying to get really everybody in our society that is not in a monogamous relationship to use barrier contraception for oral sex, dental dam and condoms but it certainly is something that we should advocate. And for those of you that have not had a root canal, which is what dental dam is used for, it actually is a thin rubber plastic sheath that can be uh, used as another form of barrier uh, contraception or just barrier in terms of HIV and STDs. And of course, using condoms when having sex with a male. So what do we take away from Sophia? That we ask all adolescent and young adult patients about sexual orientation and sexual behaviors, that we should assess their feelings about disclosing, and understand that behavior does not match identity, so it's still important to discuss contraception and condom use. All right, so let's move on to Lola. Lola is a 19-year-old who comes in and when you do an adolescent psychosocial history, which is what we call the head's history, you discover that she's living with friends, she's not doing very well in community college, and she is down on most days. And when you ask her about what's going on, she said she recently came out to herself and her parents and did not have a positive response the way that the previous client had. So this is an issue that really can happen when young people come out to their families, especially in more conservative communities. Um, Atlanta itself is filled with young people that have actually fled from small towns and communities throughout the rural South, and in a lot of ways becomes the stepping off point towards moving to other parts of this country. But many of the young people first come to Atlanta, and unfortunately, um, Atlanta doesn't necessarily have all the resources that we need and young people sometimes end up on the street selling their bodies in what we call survival sex in order to actually keep uh, just functioning and living. And what happens with uh, coming out to families, sometimes the families will reject them or say that you know it is totally incompatible with God and with their religious beliefs. Um, in small school districts, if somebody comes out, there can be major issues related to violence and peer problems. Uh, certainly stigma comes into the uh, equation and what happens is you end up with young people that do not feel good about themselves and have negative self-esteem which is what leads to risk behaviors. So again, just because somebody is gay does not mean they need to go to see a psychiatrist. But if you have somebody who is a sexual minority and you do assess their risk, you find out that young people are overrepresented in suicidal thoughts about twice as likely to report depression. And young men having sex with men um, are often on the pathway towards eating disorders such as anorexia and bulimia, definitely overrepresented compared to heterosexual youth. And again, you know, for young people that come out, these can be real consequences. And this is why it's really important 
for us when we're doing supportive counseling to young people to find out where they are in terms of coming out to their family, to their school, to their friends, and to assist them in working through those issues so that they don't drop out of school, so that they don't become homeless, and that they don't become a victim of harassment as well. And when you look at harassment, this is really, really terrible information when you realize 14% were harassed at least once within the 12 months and it didn't even matter if the person was gay, lesbian, or bisexual, it was the perception. And 4%, that's just a little over 1 in 20, were harassed 12 or more times. And how is a young person supposed to develop a good sense of self when they're being harassed all of this time. So as a coping mechanism, Lola started to drink with increasing frequency. So do sexual minority youth, uh, youth face disproportionate risk of substance abuse? Unfortunately, yes. And whereas we're you know, certainly long-term concerned about tobacco, to me the most discouraging disparity is when you start looking at cocaine and the numbers are uh, perhaps a little bit less dramatic because the total percentage is less but young people are also overrepresented using methamphetamine and use of MDMA which is of course in ecstasy or the uh, how young people are referring to it now as uh, Molly but um, these are all just terrible disparities, obviously. And when you look at, you know, 17.3% have tried cocaine before the age of 13. That's an incredibly alarming statistic. So how do we respond to her? Well, the first thing is we need to commend her on her honesty. That is something that is so critical for young people, is to let them know and reinforce the fact that we really appreciate that they trust us from having come out and allowed us to participate and assist them. Reassure her that being gay is a healthy form. Um, certainly we can express concern about her mental health and about her drinking. Um, talk about other mechanisms and sources of support. Absolutely must assess depression and especially suicide risk and then refer um, to behavioral health in terms of getting them into a regular counseling relationship. So you um, find in your sexual history with Lola that she's been in a mon monogamous relationship for the last two months. And she's never had sex with a male. Should she get a pap smear? We know this is going to be a little bit more medical, but this is also important so that you can help your young people to understand what they should be getting when they go in for checkups or for annual or even quarterly reproductive care. Should she get a pap smear? The answer is actually no. She's only 19 and currently the recommendation is routine pap smear starting at age 21. That has changed so it's very important for people to be aware that we don't do pap smears before age 21. She has had no symptoms of any problems in her vagina and has never had sex with a male. So does she need a pelvic exam? Only if we're concerned that she has um, a history of risk behaviors, has a history of unprotected sex, um, or um, is having any kind of physical symptoms that could suggest perhaps a sexually transmitted infection or other um, pathology in her vagina. And so when we look at what the Centers for Disease Control recommend in terms of their sexually transmissible infection screening for women that are having sex with women, it is the same as all women in terms of pap smear um, at, after age 21 and chlamydia at least annually but routine screenings are not recommended for the other items unless you find out that there are sexual behaviors that put them at higher risk for these specific infections. 
And HIV uh, testing does deserve just a couple of uh, minutes to talk about because things have changed somewhat with how we do HIV testing. In most settings, the traditional way is to do a very easy to do blood test called an EIA. If that's positive, and HIV is only considered positive if the backup Western blot test is positive. Well, in many settings now, there are rapid HIV tests so that you can actually do on uh, point screening right at wherever you're doing a health fair, a education program, etc. Um, so if Lola had reported sexual history with a male or had had sex toys with a female, then we might consider doing a test for gonorrhea as well. So how do you close the visit with Lola? We do advise her of community resources that exist so that she can get the help that she wants and that, that she feels as necessary. And of course, we would like to follow up with her, see how things are going, give her the results of any kind of screening tests, track to see has she actually been engaged in therapy, and continue our supportive counseling. All right, so our last case is David. David is 17. He does not identify as gay, but he's had sex with males. He presents for care, but hasn't been in the office for a year. He wants to be tested to ensure he doesn't have any STDs or STIs. And there is a change in that way of expressing that you'll see both of those terms. Sexually transmitted disease now is really more of a community term. The Centers for Disease Control really changed it to sexually transmissible infections because they really weren't diseases as much as infections. So that's why you'll see those terms, but really should be thought of as interchangeable. So what should we test them for? Well, because men that are having sex with men unfortunately don't use condoms as much as they should, the discrete guidelines for men having sex with men are much more voluminous. So we talk about absolutely doing HIV testing, absolute doing a syphilis test. Then we're also going to test um, for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Fortunately now, when we talk about a urethral test, we're not talking about Q-tips. We're talking about peeing into a cup. Um, we do a rectal test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. That's with a Q-tip. We do a throat um, test for gonorrhea. Chlamydia does not seem to live in the throat, so we actually don't test for that. So we talked a little bit about the HIV testing technology, and this is uh, more information that backs up what I was telling, but this uh, is the rapid testing that is now available. And um, actually, home testing just became available over the last couple of years. And this one actually was just released, which is the first in-home non-blood oral swab. And it is FDA approved, so you may actually have young people that go in and get this test. And if they do have this test, then, and if it is positive, we actually do need to repeat the test with blood testing to make sure. The one concern about home testing that we have is what would happen if the student finds out in isolation, will it increase their suicide risk? And the answer is not any longer. So there is no evidence for increased suicide risk. There was at one point in time when there really wasn't any effective therapy that was available. But because there is effective therapy available for HIV, um, there is no evidence currently for any increased risk should young people actually test themselves at home. But again, if it's positive, it must be repeated with a confirmatory test. Some other things to think about for men that are having sex with men um, are to test for herpes simplex type 2. It is evidence that is sort of 50-50 whether we should do it or not. So some places do it based on what we find out of the sexual history and risk taking. They should be provided hepatitis A and B immunization if they didn't complete those series when they were children. If they did not have the hepatitis B series, then we probably should test them as well with a hepatitis B surface antigen, is the screening test that we use for that important STD of the liver. 
So we have some emerging science areas just to be aware of. The first thing that's not emerging is the HPV vaccine. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But the HPV vaccine should be offered to all young people, especially sexual minority youth. Anal pap smears. Um, you can't really call it a pap smear in the same way because that really was defined by a uh, screen of the cervix. But there are more and more infectious disease and public health advocates that are talking about screening for HPV disease in the anus for men that have had anal receptive intercourse. Um, the question is what is happening and what are the effects of anal, oral, or pharyngeal um, infection with HPV? Does it lead to cancers the way that it can in the anal and the penile area? And again, we talked a little bit about uh, herpes simplex screening. So this is the vaccine for guys. Um, certainly we know there is a other vaccine for HPV that is indicated for girls, but it only has the two strains in it that would actually protect against cervical cancer. So this is known as HPV-4, or of course the brand name is Gardasil. And this is of course the vaccine that was so controversial in the news during the last election. Um, and unfortunately, some of the Republican challengers really used this vaccine as a way to talk about their own conservative agenda. Um, and it unfortunately has damaged our attempts to get young people immunized against HPV from some of the misinformation that was spread that this was a significantly injuring vaccine. This is actually one of the safest vaccines that we have. So after we discuss the test with David, we ask about condom use. He says he uses them most of the time. We have a long way to go in terms of getting young men who have sex with men to using condoms reliably. Some of it is still the invulnerability of young people, of adolescents and young adults who think that HIV is going to happen to somebody else, but it's not going to happen to them. But you see, you know, somewhere probably around a third to almost a half have engaged in unprotected anal intercourse in the last six months. So it is important for us to explore, if you find somebody who's not using condoms, why are you not using condoms? We really go into motivational interviewing, finding out what are the obstacles? How can the young person come up with a plan to overcome the obstacles? Sometimes you'll hear discomfort. Sometimes they'll say condoms aren't big enough, um, but it's really to roll with resistance and to really strongly continue to advocate use of condom use. And to use, um, in this situation, you tell people to practice using different brands because there is a condom that will be comfortable for them. So finishing up David, again, we would follow those 2010 CDC screening guidelines when testing um, for STIs and in men that are having sex with men, we would counsel regarding condom use and uh, close the visit and then hopefully schedule him back to get his test results. So we've uh, kind of reached the end of the major part of the presentation. So again, going back here, I hope you think that you have attained these objectives that we uh, talked about at the beginning. and. These are um, programs now that are in, avail uh, in Atlanta and then uh, available in other communities. And it is important uh, when you're developing a referral list to actually look for agencies and organizations that do support sexual minority youth in your local communities. If you're in a smaller community that doesn't have them, then there are other national resources. These are national LGBT health centers, um, if you're in one of these communities. These are wonderful advocacy organizations that all have information related to resources that you can use for healthcare providers. And then in terms of family support services, uh, PFLAG has been around for a very long time and is probably the prototype. They have a ton of useful information to really help to shape attitudes of parents and friends of sexual minority youth. There's also the Family Acceptance Project that is done at San Francisco State. 
Um, so there are other support organizations. These are organizations that really want to help young people to overcome discrimination. The Trevor Project is a really important resource to know about. It is the only around-the-clock crisis and suicide prevention hotline. And you see the number that's right there. And then there are other resources that you'll see in the next couple of slides. So um, thank you very much for your time. And certainly, if you have questions or need further resources, then we certainly recommend that you contact our host organization and we can provide some of those resources for you. So again, thank you for your time and I'm going to turn this back to Dr. Harrington. Thank you so very much and on the behalf of Dr. Gil Maddox, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry here at Moore School of Medicine and Director of the HBCU Center for Excellence, we want to just thank Dr. David Levine for this excellent fact-filled Pre webinar on title again, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Questioning Youth Behavior Health Webinar. Thank you again, Doctor. Uh, we certainly appreciate that. And a few questions here i like to leave with the audience, and that is um, we'd like for uh, all our students and faculty to visit the Counseling Center on campus. Uh, they have a wealth of information that they can provide for you, supportive information, as well as peer educators on counseling, uh, on the, uh, peer educators on the counseling centers as well. Now, we do have additional programs here called Cognito Training, and it is a student-based uh, uh, program that recognizes uh, students who are having challenges on campus, and we like for faculty and staff to avail themselves to that program. Um, again, if there's further questions, I'll go to the HBCU CFE website, and you can also email Joan Trent at jtrent at Morehouse School of Medicine, and she will be there to assist you in any other further questions, as well as the doctor who presented the webinar today. Again, we want to thank all of you for being on the webinar. We want to thank the professor here for presenting it, and I will bid you goodbye at this time.